here's his back. That's a front leg and a back leg. Um, often what you're thinking about determines what you see uh, in your environment. And, uh, and I know because I'm in Canada and you're all environmentally conscious and sensitive about saving marine mammals, you of course all see the, the dolphins here, right? That, there's a dolphin right there. And that's a dolphin tail there. There's a dolphin. Or is it? <laughs> Even knowing what's coming, it's still hard not to see it, so the orientation of how you perceive the world changes what it seems to really be. Or you can count the election uh, chads, that is how many black dots do you see on the screen? Of course, the answer is zero. There are no black dots on the screen. They aren't even in my computer here. They're in your retina and my retina. It's a white after image effect. With a shadow illusion, uh, what's the difference between uh, these two squares, B, A, and B? And the answer is nothing. They're actually the same shading. It's just that with the uh, context around it, and the shading makes it look like they're different. With the table illusion, the, these are the exact same tables. It's just that if you put the legs in different places and you or, uh, and, uh, reorient them, they look different. But at the bottom, you can see they're the exact same rectangle. The impossible crane illusion, of course, you could say, ah, oh, come on, Sherber, that's... That's, a, that's an illusion in 2D. Anybody can fool the brain in 2D with the board seemingly bending back and forth around in the front to the back and vice versa. Well, here's the impossible crate illusion in 3D. That's my friend Jerry Anders, the late Jerry Anders. is a professional magician who specialized in designing large three-dimensional illusions that fool the brain. This was his most famous one. Camera angle is everything. <laughs> so with the photographer far to the left, shooting this board appears to overlap with this, uh, this one, this one, this one overlaps with this one, this cord has a cable in it. Uh, this overlaps with that, that overlaps with that, but even knowing how the illusion is done, it's still almost impossible not to have the 3D illusion pop back in. So restricted in our brains, evolved in a way to see things in our world a certain way. The face on Mars is a popular one among geophologists. That is, the Martians must have built this monumental architecture to signal to us, here we are, uh, with a little face there. It is a striking image. How can you not see a face? And of course, um, it's because our facial recognition network in our brain kicks in when you have basically three pieces of data, two eyes and a nose, or two eyes and a mouth. Here's the face on Mars uh, up close in uh, 2001 after umpteen letters to NASA and JPL. They said, all right, we'll photograph the damn thing up close. <laughs> so there it is. But if you squint, the face pops back out. And by squinting, you're reducing the data from fine grain to coarse grain, and that, that causes your facial recognition network to kick in and you see the face. And actually, there's happy faces all over Mars. There's, there's a happy face. There's a happy face. Only three data points. There's Kermit the Frog on Mars. There he is. <laughs> the geologists were elephants. Perhaps they'd write uh, eloquently about uh, the amazing formation of rocks like this in, uh, outside of Las Vegas. Here's the nun bun discovered by a baker in Tennessee. It's now a t-shirt you can get. I know because I have one. The guy sent it to me. Uh, and he used to charge people five bucks a piece to come see the nun bun until he got a cease and desist letter from Mother Teresa's lawyer. <laughs> Charity is one thing, but uh, here's uh, Jesus in a tooth filling. Again, you kind of have to squint, but there's the mouth, bearded mouth, nose, eyes, and the long hair. Here's Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Watsonville. Tree bark is a terrific medium uh, for patternicities. It's kind of blotchy and your brain fills in. Uh, the pattern there, to me, it looks more like an owl or a, a falcon or something than a, than a Lady of Guadalupe. Here's the Virgin Mary on the side of a building in South Howell. Uh, here's Our Lady of uh, the Chicago Underpass. Uh, it's a nice little water stain there, but as you can see, a lot of really religious people came and not so religious people. <laughs> Here's the Virgin Mary on a grilled cheese sandwich. Sold at uh, eBay for $28,500 to, of course, a Las Vegas casino. Uh, so uh, that's my friend Joe Nickel and I holding the Virgin Mary. There she is up close. Uh, it is a strike. 
check your face. Your, your facial recognition network in your brain definitely turns on for that. But does it really look like the iconography of uh, Virgin Mary from the Middle Ages? To me, it looks more like a, sort of a Hollywood starlet. Maybe from a 1950s movie with a sultry look. Here's the Virgin Mary in Clearwater, Florida. It's a two-story bank building. Uh, I was there on a Good Friday uh, where there were people there in their crutches and wheelchairs to be healed. Um, I was there with, the, on the left there, uh, Richard Dawkins and the Amazing Randy, and we, we basically walked around the building. There was all these thousands of candles people had uh, purchased to help make the mortgage on this building, in this church spot, to preserve the miracle. And, and basically, uh, it turns out that clear water, Florida, it, it isn't. It isn't clear at all. The water is very uh, mineralized. It stains the windows. So wherever there's a sprinkler and like a palm tree, you get staining on the windows. In fact, we found a, uh, another Virgin Mary on the backside that they started to wipe off. I guess you can only have one, one miracle per building. Uh, but there's the sprinkler hand. They cut the palm tree down so you can see it better. Wow. Uh, so again, what, back to that what's more likely question. Is it really a miracle of Mary or is it a miracle of Mars? Well, I'm not Catholic, but I am a Simpsons fan, so that's what I saw when I saw the miracle. In part, what's going on here is uh, sort of the mother of all cognitive biases. There's a bunch of them, but this is my favorite, the confirmation bias. That is, we look for and find confirmatory evidence for what we already believe and ignore all the disconfirmatory evidence. That is, you remember the hits and you forget the misses. You go to the phone to call your friend Bob. Your friend Bob calls. You can't believe it. Wow, that's incredible. I was just thinking about you. I was just going to call you. And you called me. Mom, must be something in the force. You know, like some kind of psychic thing or a union connection there, a synchronicity. Yeah, wait. How many times did you go to the phone to call your friend Bob? Bob didn't call. How many times did Bob call? You weren't thinking of your friend Bob. In other words, you have to have the whole, the whole data set to know whether that particular data point stands out as a part of chance or as something more significant. And uh, uh, this is a shot taken. I did a TV show with Bill Nye, the science guy, in which we uh, I did readings all day for a bunch of different subjects on uh, I did tarot card readings, astrological readings, poem readings, and uh, talk, and I'm talking to the dead. It turns out uh, anybody can talk to the dead. It's getting the dead to talk back, that, that turns out to be the hard part. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a trick. It's a cold reading trick. Um, but, uh, and I won't go into how that's done. It's not that hard. We've published quite a bit in Skeptic on how to do it. You can do it with just a little bit of practice. I did it with no practice at all. And uh, well, basically you throw out a lot of generalities. You become more and more specific. Um, uh, and you wait for the feedback, and then you feed back what they feed you, and they end up doing the reading. You just ask a lot of questions. <coughs> Ma'am, I don't know what this means, but um, I'm getting a, uh, a, a man standing behind you. Feels like a father figure to me. It could be a father, grandfather, uncle, friend of the family. <laughs> Help me out here. Because it's, it's not real clear, you know, on the other side, it's a little fuzzy. And, uh, and, and, and then she'll tell me, uh, and then I'll just say, well, you know, yes, don't tell me now. I'm getting a grandfather. Is it your grandfather? Yes, how did he know? Because you just told him. Uh, and, and it works like that. Um, you know, uh, uh, ma'am, I'm getting, uh, she's telling me something. Uh, you used to wear your hair longer when you were younger. Yes, she's telling me something about longer hair. Or earring missing. Or a uh, tool in the garage that's broken you've been meaning to fix. Or drawer in the chest of drawers stuck. Or post-it note that you've been meaning to throw away. Out-of-date calendar, white car, red dress. You just throw things out, drop and fire, hundreds and hundreds of them. You can get at least a dozen hits by chance. They'll remember those. They'll forget the 259 you missed. And walk out of there uh, happy they spent the 300 bucks or whatever you charge for your psychic readings. Um, I found that the palm readings are great because you're actually touching somebody that seems to really make them believe. The tarot cards are also very good because you have something to point to. Um, and, and I always palmed and made sure that the death card came up. <laughs> that, always, that always kind of freaked people out. But the astrological chart, I used, I downloaded some chart from some, some old guy from the 50s or something. No, he's probably dead. And I just did the same reading on everybody. You know, I did this, you know, when the moon is in the seventh house and, and Jupiter is aligned with Mars. And, and peace will guide the planets and love will steer the stars. And, and these were younger students, so it was just, they had no idea. calculations. And back to our, our where we started with the miracle and sort of wrap things up here. 
If we can find a miracle, it's 